Well, good morning once again. Welcome to Focus Today. I'm Steve Johnson, and joining us is Patrick Doyle, uh, counselor extraordinaire. I think that's what it says on his card. <laughs> I've seen them before, something like that. We're going to be talking about, uh, we've given you kind of a preview of uh, what we're going to be talking about. It has to do with boundaries. We're talking about the personal space, you and others. Uh, I'm not going to say much more than that because there may be <laughs> a lot more of the nuance to it that needs to be explained. Patrick, yeah. thanks for joining yeah, us. Thank you. Top of the uh, top of the focus today morning to you. Thank you. Same to you. And uh, boundaries. Yeah. Personal boundaries. We've, you know, I remember in the past that was a it was a flavor of the week. Let's say what 15 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Boundaries. You got to yeah. know your boundaries. Yeah, yeah. Hey, don't get in my boundaries. Yeah. I won't get in your right, boundaries. Right, right. right. Um, d define when you talk about personal boundaries. How are you defining well, that? Well, I, I would I would um, I would say this. I would say it's relational boundaries. Um, and one of the things that I see all the time is that you might be in a relationship um, and, and let's say you're in a relationship and the relationship is painful to you. Okay. What should you do? Run away and hide. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Clearly that's not the answer you're looking for. <laughs> no, but that's a very popular, re re that's a very act popular reality. Well, we, none of us like pain, no. so you'd want to avoid it right. would be so, the idea. So when I talk about boundaries, one of the things I'm talking about is, you know, and, and we'll talk about it at length, but, you know, in if it, we're talking about your parents, that has a context that's very unique because you mm. can't just run away from your parents effectively. Um, if it's your spouse, if it's your kids, if it's your coworker, if it's your friend, all of those relationships have different contexts. And so one of the things that I want people to understand is that there's no one set of boundaries that like fits all. Mm. So it's very context specific. Okay, and it's, 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 it's specific to the context of the relationship. There's history that has to be taken into account. There's, you have to understand the nuances of the relationship. So I just want to say right off the bat that, listen, don't try to uh, carte blanche the boundaries. You, you have to understand the circumstances, and hopefully by the end of today, you'll have some good idea of how to go about that and what it looks like. But to your, to your point, um, or to my question, when someone is hurting you, mm -hmm. We have, in, in the counseling business, we have something called healthy detachment. You ever heard of that? Okay. Uh, I have, but I don't know if I could define it, okay, so that's so, why you're here. Yes, right. Yeah. So healthy detachment is very different than unhealthy detachment. And when I ask the question, if, someone, if you have a relationship with someone and it's hurting you, I want to run away and hide. Yeah. That would be an example of unhealthy detachment. So what we do is it's painful. Rather than dealing with it, and there's all kinds of reasons why we don't want to deal with it, mm -hmm. is we just cut it off. Right, right. Okay. Yep. Now, um, I don't think that's going to end well uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't resolve and or address any of the issues. So one of the reasons why I think setting boundaries is so helpful is because what it does is it brings to the surface, not just for you, but for the person you're dealing with, mm -hmm. the issue. And they don't always want to look at the issue. In fact, if you're having trouble with someone and they're hurting you, it's usually because they're unaware of what they're doing. They have denial, they have really? rationalization, they oh. have minimization. You know, the, like, take, take for example, a, a husband and a wife. Uh, the husband says something hurtful to the wife, the wife says something hurtful to the husband, and they, they, they act like nothing happened. I, 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 didn't, I didn't say that, or no, that's not what I meant, or no, you misunderstood, or you're just, you know, mm -hmm. they won't accept responsibility, okay? If you're in a relationship with someone who will not re accept responsibility for their wrong, how are you going to deal with that? Well, especially since that other person thinks they're losing their mind. I know what you said. Exactly. I know the intent. Exactly. And now you're saying the rules have changed. Exactly. That's not what happened. Exactly. You know? And now, you, now you've got a whole other discussion, don't you? Exactly. And so... I use the word discussion nicely. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing. I think you bring up a very good point, Steve, which is that um, many people that I've dealt with over the years feel like they're going crazy in a relationship where they're being harmed because the person that they're in the relationship with never takes responsibility. So I have a rule of thumb. Okay. Um, I'm a fairly, um, you know, a with it person. I can understand most people. I can have a conversation with just about anybody. Um, and I can track with people. Usually at the end of my conversations, I am not confused. Okay. okay. If you're in a relationship with someone and every, the majority of the time, you feel confused at the end of the conversation, it's because you're being manipulated. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, and so you're not losing your mind necessarily. No. And it's a very dysfunctional yeah, in, relationship. In, right, so I see this in marriages a lot where one spouse, you know, 
has, I, I put it this way, one spouse is responsibility Teflon. Mm. Nothing sticks. The other spouse is responsibility Velcro. <laughs> Everything, <laughs> Everything does. Everything sticks. Yeah. <clears throat> In those dynamics, to start, to start to deal with that problem, you're going to have to set up some boundaries. Which, which is going to cause conflict. Okay, uh, let's just pause there for a moment because I have a lot of questions okay. for you and I think some of our viewers and listeners okay. might as well. You can be part of the discussion. The number that we have is 541-776-5368 and we can get into this because as you can see, it's a little bit more than just uh, touchy-feely <laughs> boundaries kind <laughs> yeah, of a thing. Right. This gets into the where the rubber meets the road. Exactly. So you can call us now, 776-5368. Um, okay, so... A person feels, let, let's take the, the track, the scenario you've laid okay. out. Had a discussion with somebody, you thought it went well, then all of a sudden it takes a weird little turn and you're saying, um, okay, mm -hmm. now we're ending this discussion. This is not how right. um, I'm perceiving mm -hmm. uh, how it went, and right. now I feel manipulated. Mm -hmm. um, I would ask you what the right response is, mm -hmm. but let me, before we get into that mode, when that kind of thing happens, and you're being manipulated, mm -hmm. there's going to be further action. It doesn't end right there. Exactly. That is going to further into another chapter yes. where you're going to be put into a corner for some reason, or, yeah, right? Yeah. So the scenario mm -hmm. hasn't ended, mm -hmm. and that's when you may want to run, right. but it's only going to get worse, yes, right? Yes, exactly. If you, don't, if you don't do something to confront the issue, it, they only get worse. Things don't, um, you know, the second law of thermodynamics, everything goes, basically, entropy, everything goes from order to disorder naturally. Everything erodes, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So if you do nothing, you know, in, in second law of thermodynamics, last I checked, is the most provable physical science law there is, which is another problem for evolutionists, but that's a whole other program. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if everything goes from order to disorder naturally, how do we go the other way? Yeah. But, My so, lawn is a perfect example of that. <laughs> exactly. If I don't mow it or yes. trim it, it keeps going into I disorder. Am a perfect, <laughs> I'm a perfect example <laughs> oh, of it. <laughs> well, I think of you and my lawn simultaneously. <laughs> well, that's good. So, <laughs> so um, the, the, before I answer that, that question, I want to lay out a foundational truth I think is important for people to understand. When you look at Scripture, what you see with God is a, is a absolute relational reality. So you have the Holy Trinity, three people, God, Holy Spirit, God the Son, God the Father, all God, and live three persons living as one relationally in perfect harmony. Right, okay, yeah, that is... It's relational harmony. The ultimate example. Yeah. profound power. Okay, in our culture, in our world, when there's someone with profound power, it doesn't usually lead to harmony. Mm-hmm, yeah, that's true, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so, and then God comes to earth in the form of Christ and dies on the cross to bring what? Relationship to us. So his whole intent is relational. <clears throat> So one reason why I think boundaries are important is because what they're doing is they're causing difficulty. That's mm -hmm. what they do. And that difficulty leads to hopefully a resolve of the problem so that we can live in relational harmony. And not have to have those boundaries. And, yeah. Right. And here's the thing, though. Every time you set a boundary, you're taking a risk. Mm. Because when you set a boundary, there's two things that can happen. The relationship can move towards health or it can move towards uh, dis further dysfunction and, mm. and not being a relationship that you're willing to be in. And this is where I see people, they understand the need for boundary until it comes to, you mean I could lose the relationship? Mm. And then what yeah. happens is instead of taking that, that stance, they, they bend into the, to the relationship, they fall under the, the person's manipulation, they, they, and they know they're doing it, but they're not willing to take the risk to push it to the side and take and take the take the relationship and put it on the table. And I would say, <clears throat> from God's economy, He wants us to move towards relational health. That's His whole purpose. All right, a lot to talk about here with uh, boundaries. Obviously, I mean, we just uh, barely scratched yeah. the surface. Sherry has joined us five four one seven seven six five three six eight on the line with us. And you got a question about those people who uh, perhaps uh, create their own boundaries in other people's <laughs> lives and are manipulative. What is, what is that, Sherry? It breaks my heart. I was listening to the very beginning. You talk about the characteristics of people who are manipulative, and right. Um, God help me describe my son, and um, wow. I'm seeing a pattern. He's in his early 30s uh, in relationships that describes 
uh, you described. Right. And my question to you is, um, as a mother and someone who cares about him and also cares about the people that have been in this relationship with him that I believe he's really manipulating, Right. he's a never-wrong kind of guy, um, very prideful, um, and, uh, very, you know, he was my strong-willed kid, mm-hmm. and he just is now an adult who's strong-willed, but, yeah. you know, has a different label <laughs> on him now. Yeah. Um, so my question to you is, how do I... I'm approaching a point where I need to sit down and have a conversation with him. Right. And I guess, how, how, what's the best way to approach people that are in that mindset of never wrong and, you know, it's all everybody else? Right. That's a great question. Hey, so does your, does your son claim to have a relationship with Christ? You know, I can barely hear you. Um, does, your son okay. ha- does your son claim to have a relationship with Christ? Does he claim to have a relationship with Christ? With yeah. Christ, yes, mm-hmm. he does. <clears throat> okay, um, so does he have any men in his life that he res- respects and trusts that he would listen to? You know, that is a really good point because in my prayer time, I've been really hearing that it's not my place at this time to mm-hmm. have that discussion with him. It's his place that his father does. Right. <clears throat> would his dad do it? You know, I think he would. Um, my concern is that um, his dad is not overly strong in his relationship with Christ, mm-hmm. um, right. and so that's a concern for me. And also, his dad deals with some of the same stuff in regards to they both kind of have learning disability issues, and they okay. both <clears throat> they both kind of trouble processing their thoughts. The, yeah, they both kind of overcompensate for their insecurities with the bravado. Yes. Okay, so. Yes. So, you know, without knowing everything about the situation, here's one thing I would say um, is I would sit down and I would ask God to give me wisdom to craft a letter to him. And in the letter, what I want you to do is I want you to give him very concrete behavioral examples of what you have seen that caused you the concern. And when you, when you lay that out, to him, and then you say, son, I'm concerned about this, I love you, I want you to consider these things, and then you sort of let it go. Since you're not in the relationship with him in terms of, you know, his wife or whatever, you can't really, you don't have a lot of power there, but I think you're reflecting the truth that you see, he respects you, and that may be a seedbed for God to convict him, because I, I got the impression that there's no one really speaking into his life. He's got the, everybody pushed to the side. So... I would sit down and give, but here's the, here's the key thing. Clear behavioral examples, not I feel, not I think. You did this, mm-hmm. you did that, you did this, and all those things make me concerned about this. Mm-hmm. Kind of set up your argument with uh, your yeah, concerns. Beha- that way. Your yeah. behavioral examples, because he's already in profound denial. Right. And the reason why I want you to write it to him is because you'll never get through the conversation. Yeah, you're right. He'll never let you finish. Here's the other thing. People like your son have a high level of pride. They will not accept responsibility in front of someone else generally uh, Mm -hmm. without an act of God. So when you write it to him in the privacy of his own house and his own private time, he can read that letter and have his reaction and he can reread it. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to be there for the reaction. (laughs) So, you know, I... I was reading Mere, I'm reading Mere Christianity for the first time. When What a profound book. Absolutely. I've always been a fan of C.S. Lewis, and I just had never gotten around to reading this one, and I just am reading a section on the greatest sin, which is pride. Exactly. And it just really hmm. solidified, you know, where yeah. the root of this is. C.S. C.S. Lewis, um, Lewis, Lewis in that book said that pride is the ultimate anti-God state of being. And I really agree with that. Oh. I appreciate your question, and I hope I helped. Yeah. Uh, we got to get to a break, though. Sherry, I thank you very much. Your help. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, you know, I have a feeling we're going to be revisiting this again. So yeah. feel free to call us back and let us know how things are going that way. Well, welcome back to Focus today. Patrick Doyle is our guest, and we're talking specifically about boundaries in relationships. And who knows? Maybe you've got that situation that is looming where you think, "I don't want to be with these people, but I have to. I'm related to them." Or it could be any number of of situations like that. 
that are coming up during the it's summertime. It's almost Christmas. <laughs> it's, oh, <clears throat> Christmas is right around the corner. There's always some yeah. sort of event like that. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about boundaries, and we've taken one phone call. We want to encourage you. You can be a part of this discussion at 541-776-5368 right here at the Dove. Let, let me just bring it back a little bit almost to how we started the program a little bit. Boundaries in relationships. Uh, when when is it that we need to know that we have to have boundaries, mm -hmm. Patrick? Uh, what what are the highlights to say you've mm -hmm. got to set some boundaries here, or your relationship is just going right. to go down the tubes? Okay, so here's what I say. Uh, uh, what I see with a lot of folks is that <clears throat> they they think that other people determine whether or not you should have boundaries. I say elaborate on that. Yeah. So uh, I say that. If you're in a relationship and you are in pain, the majority of the time, as a result of the relationship, you need a boundary. Mm. And I don't care where the relationship, I don't care what kind of relationship it is. And here's the thing, you are the one who determines if it's painful, not the person who's hurting you. Boy, that's the ultimate in manipulation, though, isn't it? For them to yes. be able to manipulate you. And how could you feel the pain? I'm yeah. the one who feels the pain yeah. and then continues on that right. way. Right. So here's the other thing. Uh, title of a great book I read years ago, You Can't Heal What You Can't Feel. So if Sounds you... like a book Jesse Jackson wrote. <laughs> <laughs> you can't feel if you can't heal, or <laughs> yeah, vice versa. It, it, if but he wrote no. it, it wouldn't be true, but that's another story. <laughs> 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 Did my opinion slip out so there? So what, <laughs> what was that title again? Let's you can't get that. heal what you can't feel. You can't heal what you can't feel. Okay. So if you're in a relationship and you're in pain, but you're living in denial and you're rationalizing, minimizing, justifying, spiritualizing the pain, then how are you going to heal? Okay. So here's the other very unfortunate reality about the world we live in. Pain is a pre precursor to resolution. Well, you know... Um, C.S. Lewis, to refer to him again, yes. he talks about pain, and he was talking about the physical kind, yes. being God's wake-up call, yeah. alarm call. Yeah. So what you're saying is from a relationship mm -hmm. standpoint, we could take that principle as well. I think, it's, I, think it's more, I think it's more common for people to be in relational pain than uh, physical pain. And I think the emotional pain is way more damaging uh, for the soul of the person. And mm. so what I see a lot of is people living in bad relationships, which I think God clearly says, that's not what I want. I've right. given you a power. And I've given you my spirit. I've put my love within you. I want you to trust me for the outcome. And where we get hung up is we want what we want. We want the relationship to go the way we want it to. We don't want the possibility of it ending. Right, right. That and makes God's, sense. And God's like, are you going to trust me or are you going to trust you? If you trust you, you're going to have to stay in a relationship that's hurting you. So, <clears throat> so let's take <clears throat> a parent, for example. You have a parent in your life who's painful. Okay. The parent is unhealthy, emotionally unhealthy. They got their own bag of tricks. They went through their own trauma, whatever. They've always been unhealthy. The Bible says you're to honor your mother and father. What does that mean? I, uh, yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> that definition is very important. Because so, some pe people mean, uh, well, it just means doing whatever they say I should do. <clears throat> right, or it means that I am required to have an intimate relationship with them. Ah, okay. That's how I honor them. Well, I'm telling you right now, from my, my study of the Scripture, that's not what it means. Okay? Uh, and if your parent is <laughs> abusive, hurtful, self-centered, mean, n abandoning, neglectful, whatever, you're supposed to stay connected to that? Mm. Now, I know that as kids we want to, okay, right. but I cannot sacrifice myself on the spear of an unhealthy parent so that I'm not able to love my wife and kids, so that I'm not able to be loved by God, whatever. So with a parent particularly, you know, I think what, what the scripture is saying when it says honor your parents, honor your mother and father is, is that you're, you're to, to make sure as they get older that they have dignity. Hmm. That if they're sick, they need help, you don't let them just be in a bad situation. You do your best to give them dignity, to honor them as people. Okay, But it doesn't mean you have to have an intimate relationship with them. My dad was a violent alcoholic. And as a Christian, I'm supposed to have a good and intimate relationship with him? It's hmm. not possible. Okay, some people, it's not possible to have a relationship of any kind of health because they're so unhealthy. And I know there's many people listening to me who are thinking about their parents going, oh yeah, 
Mm-hmm. Okay, but we don't want to look at it that way. Yeah. So, but the most loving thing that we could do in a relationship where we're being harmed is to stop the person from harming us. That's the most loving thing we can do. But in the church, a lot of times, what we what we're told, or what's sort of you know, so they look over their glasses, they sort of insinuate it. They don't say it. Is you're supposed to tolerate it. I don't believe that. I don't believe Jesus did that. When he was dealing with the Pharisees, what did he say? Oh, hey guys, how's it going? Yeah. Can't wait to have a good relationship with you. No, you brood of vipers, you sons of snakes. Right. I know what's in your heart. I know what you're trying to do. I'm not going for it. And I think that's God wants us to not be a doormat. No, at the same time, he doesn't want us to be proud and arrogant and self-centered and isolated. He wants us to be in good and profound relationships, but you can't do that if you're not willing to deal with the issues in the relationship. And boundaries, you telling another person, look, this is where I start or end, and this is where you start or end. This is what I'm willing to do. This is, I'm not what, you, you cannot talk to me like that. You cannot mistreat me like that. I will not tolerate it. If you continue, I will not have a relationship with you. Mm. I will not talk to you. Mm-hmm. So I have done this within my own family multiple times with people in my family who are, have addicted, have addiction issues. And you know, I'm, I'm a trained professional, right? I should be able to help these people. <laughs> well, no, I can't help them. They don't want help. Mm. They'll take from me. They'll use me. They'll leave me high and dry. And, and who suffers? My grandmother had a great saying. <laughs> this, my grandmother was born in 1898 in Dothan, Alabama. She's a Southern woman. And okay. she, had, she had a lot of sayings. One of my favorites was, she said, you should never wrestle with a pig. You both get all muddy, but the pig likes it. <laughs> <laughs> so in boundaries, right. you don't want to wrestle with a pig. Yeah, I, we tend to think that uh, everybody's self-interest is the same, and yeah. it may not be. It may be quite twisted and all yeah. the rest. Let me just uh, let our uh, viewers and listeners know, if you want to be a part of the discussion, you can. You can call us 776-5368 here at the Dove. We'd like to have you a part of this discussion because you might be uh, able to hone in a little bit on some of these things, saying, you know, this is a problem that I've been having or I see coming down the pike. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we'd like to talk to you, uh, find out a little bit more about that. 776-5368 is the number. Um, I, I'm wondering that first step, one, yeah. once you're in the process, uh, mm-hmm. everyone kind of knows what's going on here as right. far as you and the other person. Right. Let's say it's between mm-hmm. two people. Right. How does a person start that if, in fact, you've been living in a very dysfunctional okay. situation and maybe you're an adult now? Right. And you're saying, I want to have this relationship. I got kids or their right. grandkids. Right. What do you do? Okay. What's that the first step? First, the first step for the person who's in the relationship, you start to realize, hey, there's something wrong here. The first thing you have to do is become clear in your own soul about what's wrong. Do All right, let me just stop you there. Do, do you find that a lot of people have not accurately identified what the problem right. is? And right. so they try to band-aid it in other ways? Well, yeah, that. but I think more specifically what happens is to be in a bad relationship, I have to practice denial. It's just a part of coping. Huh? Some, yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't want to die, so I'm going to rationalize, minimize, justify, whatever, spiritualize this hurtful thing. And I'm going to, and particularly if you're in a relationship with somebody who's responsibility Teflon, mm. they don't they ever take responsibility, and, and they're always, they're, it's always a blame shift. You go to them with something, and the next thing you know, it's your fault. Oh, you're right. Okay. So, or, or you get the, I'm sorry, but you did this, that, and the other. So no matter what you do, you always end up being responsible. Well, if you lived in reality, if you lived in the truth of that, you wouldn't tolerate it. So to get to the point where the relationship's been in a unhealthy state for a period of time, right. you've had to rationalize, minimize, justify, and deny. So getting clear about what's really happening in your own soul is the first thing. So, and, and I would say, one of my favorite things to do is to write it, to sit down and mm. write. Because here's the thing, as long as it's in my head, I can be very confused, okay? But when I write it down on a piece of paper, now it's permanent, it's stationary, it doesn't move. In my head, it's all over the place. Right. So I put yeah. it down and I can look at that, and I'm like, wow, I didn't really know I felt that way. And then two days later, I come back to it, I'm like, wow, that's, I, that's really true, I'm seeing that more and more. So you start to get clear, and once you get clear, then what you do is you have to communicate your problem, your issue, what's happening to you in the relationship 
with the person that's harming you, and you can't do it in the heat of the moment. You know, and, and that, I think, what you've hit on comes to mind. I'm thinking of some people who have had dysfunctional relationships, mm -hmm. and they keep going back trying to fix it without that process that you said, exactly. without that moment of uh, introspection, yeah. yeah, to say, okay, you know, and i got to get this straight in my mind or I'm never going to be able to express exactly. what the problem is. Exactly. I think what you mentioned to Sherry about writing it out mm -hmm. to her son right. also helps not only mm -hmm. him not to be able to have a comeback, but mm -hmm. also for her to actually write it down right. and then maybe tear up the first one, come yep. up with a second one, you know, and say, exactly I, right. here's what I really need to right. come down to because exactly. here's the nut of the problem. Exactly. Do you find when people do that that they, uh, you alluded to this a little yeah. bit, do you find that they identify things they didn't know because exactly. it would have been swirling so before? So here's what happens. I start to write. I write things down. I'm like, um, this one thing's really in my mind. I start to write. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah. Oh, oh. And it sort of spills out. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think sometimes it takes one, two, maybe three or four passes. And here's the other thing I would say. When you sit down to write, no editing. If it's, oh, okay. if it's and the pages are tearing and there's maybe some expletives in there, you just let it out. Now, this is something you're writing for yourself. First and foremost, you're right. just getting okay. it down. So right. you, and, and so here's the other thing. As you express this stuff on paper, what's happening is you're releasing some of the tension. So, yeah. that, so that when you <laughs> that's for sure so that taking when, it out on the paper well yeah, yeah and so that when you do have when you are able to have the discussion you're not sitting there vibrating ready to pounce because you're so resentful and you're so hurt and you're so intense because you're tired of it yeah okay so it's you got to get to a place of clarity before you can make an effective confrontation or set an effective boundary if you're doing it in reaction you're going to probably re-harm okay so to recap briefly uh You've noticed a problem. You're being manipulated. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me uh, uh, throw this out to you, and yeah. you tell me if, okay. if I'm right on all this. Um, you have an inkling. There is that thing that says, you know, this is not working. I keep yeah. trying to resolve this, and I just, I get rebuffed. Right. I can't say what I'm trying to say, right. and I walk away frustrated. Right. You're saying stop and say, write out what it is that frustrates right. you. You're mm -hmm. writing it to yourself primarily, mm -hmm. saying, right. I think this stinks because right. this is <laughs> right. what's happening. Okay, we've let it out. Right. It's on the paper. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit of a relief, but then you also realize, I haven't really resolved anything. Yeah. And what happens? Now what, I start to res well, now what I start to see on the paper is what the problem is. This person doesn't respect me. This person doesn't, is not mm. trustworthy. This person is verbally abusive. This person is isolating. Whatever. Because you've identified all of those feelings that you yeah, have. Yeah, it starts. Okay. It starts to. It starts to become clear. So when when you set the boundary, like I said before, you can't do it in the heat of the moment. And I I, I prefer uh, boundaries being in writing because um, you can refer to them. Uh, very rarely do you set a boundary with somebody where they don't spin it. Well, I didn't because, and that's not what I said, and how come? This is in the dialogue yeah, that you're having. But if okay. you have a piece of paper and you're, and you're like, well, remember when we said this? And you can refer back to the document, that settles a lot of that spin. And people who want to spin don't want to be held down. They don't want things to be specific, which is another thing that happens in relationships is somebody never, never gets specific about what they did. It's uh, always a general apology. There's never confession. There's never a uh, contriteness. There's never remorse. There's never an owning of responsibility. We see that a lot in politics. Absolutely. I mean, there is a tie-in, I think, to all of that. Absolutely. People, not corporations or whatever, not yeah. willing to take responsibility. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, the type of, I'm sorry if I offended you, right. which isn't an apology no, at it's all. It's a blame is shift. It? Yeah. You, you know, maybe mm. you shouldn't be so sensitive. <laughs> You yeah, know. well, I'm sorry if, if you were offended, too, because you're just way too sensitive. Exactly. <laughs> wow. So, so okay. if you want healing in a relationship, the only way for healing to happen is for the offender to take responsibility. Now, can I forgive the person if they never repent? Sure. But if you're in a relationship with that person, they keep harming you every day, that's going to be hard. I say you need to put some distance between you and that person so that you can heal. And also get some perspective, which is the other thing that I would say, is that sometimes you need to pull away from the relationship actually in terms of time spent so you can get clear. Mm -hmm. When you're in the mix of it all the time, it's really hard to see clearly. And like I said, if it's your parents particularly or family members, uh, I, I say this a lot, parents to a child, you can be a very strong person as, uh, as an individual and you go to your parents and they're your kryptonite.
Mm -hmm. They have all kinds of power that you don't even know about. You just show up and you <laughs> feel weak, okay? Because they're your parents. Yeah. So yeah. it's even more important to get that distance and get clear. The other thing I would say is that I really would want you to involve another set of eyes. Somebody else to look at what you're, what you're seeing to get some confirmation. Because if you have confirmation with someone else who sees it, it's so helpful because you realize, I'm not crazy. I do see this. This is real. This person is seeing it. Now, I suppose you could have a sibling who could be those eyes, but that's dangerous too because yeah. there's a lot of relationship right. situations that aren't neutral. Yeah. You gotta, right? you gotta, you gotta get with someone who is a safe person. And the reason why they're safe is because they've demonstrated behavior over a long period of time in your life that they are a safe person. Somebody who takes responsibility, yeah. somebody who's honest, somebody who listens, somebody who doesn't blow you off, somebody who's present when you talk to them. You know, all of those things, you need, to, you need to have that person in your life. And here's what I've found. People that are in relationships where they're being hurt don't usually have those kind of people in their life. Oh, okay. So well, you, I'm might also to, you might have to reach outside of your circle. Yeah, because I'm thinking you may surround yourself with people you want to be with because they're yes people. I mean, you may have your own baggage as well. Yeah. We all have Everybody to identify does, yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So you have to look at it and say, okay, I really like this person, but I know all they're going to say is they agree with me. Yeah. So I need to find somebody else yeah. who can actually look at it and be able to be objective exactly. about it. And willing to say something difficult, mm. which is to say, you know, I yeah. think this is correct. I'm not sure about that. They're willing to look at it honestly, not just gloss it over. Those may be the best friends, but sometimes they're the hardest ones to be friends with for yes, a long time. Yes, exactly, because <laughs> you, know, you don't want to be confronted with the truth. Yeah. So, but, but it's so necessary for that to happen. So here's the other thing. Okay. So when you set a boundary with somebody, right. don't expect them to go, oh, okay, I appreciate it. In fact, if you did, you probably would realize I'm they're being blowing manipulated. me off. <laughs> yeah. I'm being manipulated again. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, <clears throat> so the, the power of a boundary, from my perspective, is the pain of it. Okay, you need to elaborate that a little bit. So when I set a boundary with somebody, it's going to cause pain. Okay. Because they don't like it. All right. And that pain, we're hoping, is what God will use to bring conviction and for them to take responsibility. If they don't, here's the difficult part. you got to hold the boundary. Mm. And here's the other thing I would say to people. Never set a boundary that you can't hold. Oh, uh, Don't shoot for the moon. Yeah, I was going to say expectations too mm -hmm. high. You got to be yeah. realistic. So I say this with people all the time, you know, like w with a kid who's, you know, misbehaving. Okay. And they're, and they're I'm going to, you know, and they go with these extreme things. And they're no more capable of doing that than a man on the moon. So I always try to tell them, look, what it, so this is what you should do. Okay, that's great. Let's, let's talk about what you can do. What's actually possible? What could you actually do and stand by? Because if you set a boundary out here mm -hmm. and then you don't hold it, what you've done is made the problem worse. Because now they don't believe you have any backbone to stand up to it and they'll, right. they'll run yeah. you over more. So you really, when you set the boundary, it has to be realistic for you. So we have, we have, that's why I said there, that each circumstance is very um, context specific. Yeah. You have to know what you're capable of. You know, if, if, it, if it's, you know, kicking a kid out, can you actually do that? Yeah. All right. Well, Can let's, you hold it? let's talk about <clears throat> one of those specific situations. Michelle okay. is on the line with us, and you have a family situation that you would like somebody to talk into. Uh, tell us what your concerns are there, Michelle. I have, a, well, a lot of weird concerns. I'm adopted, and okay. I still have a relationship with my biological mother, and she causes a lot of problems, not only in a relationship with her, but in a relationship with the whole entire family. Right. And it makes things difficult because a lot of things that she does, I mean, I would like to have a relationship with her. Mm -hmm. We just can never have the father or the mother-daughter relationship that we had when I was growing up because I was adopted and, you know, there's abandonment issues and sure. stuff like that. And now it's getting to the point where I don't know how to handle that. She keeps calling me and wants to have a relationship, but at the same time, she keeps doing the things that hurt me. Have and you... I keep telling her, well, if you're going to keep doing this, I don't want to talk to you. Right. Well, she'll wait a month right. and so, then pretend everything's okay and then give me a call. Hey, how are you doing? Right. What do you want? So, so your mom doesn't believe you. No. And your mom also has, is good at denial. Very good at Okay. Denial. So what she has to do is run into some pain. So mom, listen, uh, I can't do this anymore. Don't call me. And then when she calls, don't answer. 
guess that's a pretty easy way of doing it. Okay, but listen, in conjunction with that, you need to write her and communicate with her the specific reasons why you're doing this. Okay? Okay. Because what we're hoping is, is that the truth of what you're saying will penetrate her denial and get her to start seeing some things that's, that she's doing that's causing you pain. So when can Michelle start to resume possibly a good relationship? What, what has to happen? Great question, Steve. And so, Michelle, here's what I would say. Here's what I say to all people that are in this circumstance. You don't relinquish the boundary until the person has proven behaviorally, not, not words, behaviorally, they have had long-term, sustained, behavioral change. Do you understand? Yeah, that's what I've actually been going for for, you know, <clears throat> the past 13 years of my life, ever since I, you know, was taken out of her custody and adopted into right. somebody else's so home. So here's the other thing. This is the difficult part, Michelle. You know, the reason why you were taken out of her custody is because she's really sick. Mm -hmm. And if she doesn't get better, you can't have a relationship with her because she's, yeah. she's not capable. Yeah, I completely understand okay, that. So, so listen, I want to tell you something. What you want is this really deep, really wide, really rich relationship with your mom. That's an absolutely right desire. The problem is your mom's capacity instead of this is this. It's just very small. It's an inch that you have with her, not 60 feet. Yes. So what you have to do is understand what her limits are. I'm not going to share anything intimate with her. I'm not going to trust her. I'm going to say, hey, mom, how's the weather? Happy birthday. Happy Thanksgiving. Merry Christmas. It's very shallow. It's very distant. It's not intimate because she's not safe. And so, I have one more question. Is okay. it too much to ask? All I really want her to do in order to have, I know that we need, I'm sorry, excuse me, I'm kind of nervous. I've never talked on the radio before. Um, <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> I've, um, I've, all I really ask is, is that she does better for herself. You know, I, I know that I'm, I'm older now. I take care of myself. I'm right. an adult now. And, right. and um, I do a pretty darn good job of making sure that I'm taking care of right. and the things that I need to deal with or taking care of. And right. I'm a new believer in Christ, and my life has Good. been amazing ever since That's then. Great. It's just these past hurts keep popping up, and okay. I, you know, I don't think that it's mostly all my fault. And all I really want to ask for her to do in order to have a healthy relationship with her is for her to do good in her life. Right. You know, but, she's been but, homeless and an alcoholic and right. a drug addict and just having just yeah. ups and downs for as long as I can remember, and right. all I ever asked her to do, you know, she even asked me, what do I got to do to have a relationship with you? I just want <laughs> you sober. to get your own home. That's right. it. I want you to be, I want you to be good in your heart so that we can have that healthy relationship, and I don't know how to, you know, I feel like I need to Michelle. help her and mother her and tell her, you know, this, this you know, because that's what some of the things told me. Listen, you're not supposed to help her. That's not your job. Okay. Your job is to be cared for by her. The problem is she's incapable. And so part of what you have to do is face the grief that your mother is never going to be what you want. And okay. here's, the, here's the deal. In the family of God, God will provide you with a mother that will love you. I'm sorry that your mom's not capable. My dad wasn't capable. My mom wasn't capable. I walked through that myself. I totally understand it. And you don't want to spend too much energy trying to get her to be better when she's wasted her whole life. And I hope and pray that God intervenes. But until he does, it's not your job. Does that help? Yes, it does help a lot. Thank okay. you very much. You bet. This is an email, Patrick, that we got that okay. I want to read to you uh, that we received. <clears throat> And it's from a mother who writes, and she says, what, what does a mother do when a 12-year-old son lives with a father who is cross-dressing and the son is questioning his gender? Mm. Now, apparently, the, uh, they are divorced mm -hmm. and the son is living with the father at this point. Mm -hmm. And her question is, what can a mother do? How do you approach this kind of a problem? Well, the first thing that I would say is you cannot deny the sickness of the father. Now, I've never met anybody who cross-dresses or who struggles with homosexuality or whatever who isn't, doesn't have some high level of trauma in their life. 
So the okay. father, the father has some trauma in his life, uh, you know, in, from my experience, and this is how it's manifesting itself. Um, and so that makes him you know, relatively, re that makes him relationally unsafe. Now, but a 12 year old boy, that's his dad. Yeah. How, how, what 12 year old boy isn't gonna imitate his dad, okay, regardless, okay? So the mom has to, to, to do some exposing of who the, who the father is and what's going on. And you got, uh, my, my, um, my vote would be to get a professional involved for the mm. son to walk through the very confusing reality of this is who my dad is. And does that mean that's what I am? And I mean, and is that, is, am I naturally that way? Or is it because my dad, I mean, how do you separate all that at 12? Yeah. You need help. And the mom, what you can do is you can provide that way of escape for him instead of co-signing the behavior or acting like it's okay. No, you got to blow the trumpet. No, this is not okay. But you don't do it in a mean and nasty way. You're just like, you know, this is not normal. This is not good. And we need to talk to somebody about how to deal with this. And here's the other thing. <laughs> This is a long-term process. This scenario is not going to evaporate Just because that up. guy's not going to quit being, you know, unless God intervenes, the guy's going to get worse. And the son's not going to stop being a son. So you, you, you can't look at it for, I need the magic bullet or the, mm. the pill. This is, you're going to walk with this kid the rest of his life and deal with this. And here's the beautiful thing. I'm living proof that God is redemptive. He can take a very difficult cir circumstance and bring some beautiful things out of it. Mm. But that's a process. That's not an event. And when we're in a lot, when, when we're in a lot of pain, what we want is an event. <laughs> yeah, right. We want it done. Make it go away. And that's not how God does it. Now, forty with, years in the desert. And <laughs> a situation like this, I mean, you have to realize. I said you have to acknowledge a reality. If they are divorced and yeah. there's a custody issue here, yep. then the courts have to get involved. If you're going to bring in a counselor, is that right? I no, mean, no, no, no it, not necessarily. Not necessarily, okay. because on the mom's time, depending on what the custody situation is, she can take the kid to counseling. Okay. And you know, I, gotcha. I would imagine the mom has more custody than the dad if that's what's going on. But you never know. Mm -hmm. So. Those are all questions that would have to be answered by somebody, and that's why I would get a professional involved because this is high-grade trauma. Yeah, this isn't yeah. small potatoes. This is intense stuff. Well, and I think when we started talking about boundaries, you know, we're we're thinking how we commonly would define it would be the boundaries I have with another relationship that's not the way it should be. Right. This shows the extreme boundaries that yes, can take place. Exactly. I mean, this, this would be one of those. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you have a, a question or a. a you want to talk into that whole issue of boundaries, you can be a part of the show for what we have left today uh, by calling us at 541-776-5368. Again, we're talking with Patrick Doyle here about boundaries at this point. Okay, let me let me recoup kind of what we've been talking about <laughs> okay. almost for the last 50 minutes. Okay. Um, you notice you have a problem, you're being manipulated. Mm -hmm. You should sit down, write out. You're in pain. You're in pain because it keeps happening mm -hmm. over right. and over again, it's right? It's, right? It's normally a recurrent thing, Absolutely, right? okay. always. So then you, you take a paper and a pen and mm -hmm. you write out, here's how I feel about this. Mm -hmm. Wow, I didn't really know that I felt this way, but I do, mm -hmm. you know, because get, I think you're right. It's a linear way of getting around the confusion in right. your brain right. out on paper because it sits there mm -hmm. and it doesn't change. And it, okay. and it may take a little bit of time for that to actually come clear to you. I would think so. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. you're in a fog, Rela right. that relational fog of that person. Well, and for any problem solving we've done, you, you don't think in a... Um, beginning to end stage, right. you, you get hijacked, yeah. you come back, you, it's all over the map. Uh, well, but if I do this and this happens, right. what, wait, then if I go there, mm -hmm. so, all Which right. is also why it's really important to add another set of eyes, another set of ears. Okay, all right, I was, uh, let's get to that then. Mm -hmm. So you've got it down, you, you get somebody you can trust to say, take a look at this. Mm -hmm. um, is, do you see the situation mm -hmm. as I do this way? Okay, okay. Let, let me add a note of caution right here. All right. Because I've seen the process get, go haywire at this point. Um, I'm thinking that third person could be a real wild card, right? Exactly. That person could really be helpful or they could be really be damaging. Mm. And um, I say this in, in love and respect, but <laughs> the church is sometimes one of the worst places to go. Because a lot of times in the church what people want to do is they want to gloss over the problem and just have harmony. Okay. Just, I think we can relate to that. Just yeah. live at peace with all men. Well, do you realize that's not possible? Hmm. I mean, Jesus didn't live at peace with all men. And the, the exhortation was, uh, be, be at peace as much as is possible with as all men. Because it depends men. on you. Yeah, right. Okay, right. So, listen, if I, dis if I determine, if I determine, not what other people determine, if I determine you're unsafe, 
that's my reality. Okay. And it doesn't matter what you think. All right. This is the other thing. So that third person cannot be a glosser over, and they cannot be a spiritualizer, and they cannot be a person who's just going to say pray about it. They have to be somebody who's willing to get their shoulder under the plow okay. and walk with you through this process. Okay. And I'm just telling you from my experience, that's not everybody. It's actually kind of rare. I think I was going to say it's very yeah. few people so that you trust. You, yeah. you, and so, you know, maybe that person's not in your life. Maybe you got to reach out to somebody who is a professional. Maybe you need to go somewhere. Maybe you need to get a book to, to, to get some affirmation. And one of the books I would, I would recommend on this is um, it's a book called Safe People by Cloud and Townsend. Oh, okay. Okay. And that book in there, they describe very clear behaviors that make someone safe and what makes somebody unsafe. And people always, I always say you need to read the safe, the safe people book before you read boundaries. Because until you know who's safe, you don't know who to bounder. <laughs> mm. You got to figure out who's the unsafe person because that tells you who you put the boundary up with. Mm -hmm. But most of us are confused about safety. We're confused about who's safe. We've been lied to, we've been manipulated, we've been hurt. And so getting clear about what safe is, is really important, which is why who you reach out to is important. Um, so give it some consideration. Ask the, ask the Lord to give you insight to who to go to. Okay? okay. Don't just go to anybody because you're in a knee-jerk reaction. Take, take your time and let it develop. Okay. Because that person, you know, can really help or they can really hurt. It's, okay. a, it's a risk. All right. I want to wrap this up in just a few minutes here. Uh, let's go to Frank, though. He's got a, a question first for us. Good morning, Frank. Hey, how are you doing? Hey, Frank. Uh, I was just wondering, you know, I hear you talk about safe people a lot, but it's really hard to find safe, healthy people a lot of times. Yeah. And the dilemma is, you know, I find myself isolating because yeah. I don't want to be hurt mm -hmm. and interacting with people who aren't safe. So how do you find safe people? That's a great question. Um, you go to Walmart. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. And the people were the smiley little <laughs> yeah, buttons yeah. there. No, I'm just kidding. I, I wish it were that easy. You know, Frank, I, I, um, I think what you have to do is you have to not give up. Mm -hmm. You have to keep. Uh, I love the. Uh, I love the uh, scripture in Revelation says, "God opens doors that no man can shut, and He shuts doors no man can open." All right. So that makes my job a door handle jiggler. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just got to keep hitting the door handle and waiting for God to open the door to safety with someone. But if you stop, I guarantee the outcome. Yeah. So, yeah. and you know, with your background having trauma in it, your, in, your intention isn't usually to keep trying. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would continue to make those efforts. And here's the thing. You make appropriate small risks so that if the person doesn't end up to be safe, you don't die. And so you, 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 you know, sort of inch your way into trust. They have to earn it. It's not something you just carte blanche give them. And it's a process. And it's also something, the process is something God will really teach you a lot about you and Him. And in that process, I believe you'll find greater intimacy with Christ in learning to be dependent on Him rather than you surviving. Make sense? That's true. Yeah. Good job. Thanks. You bet. Frank, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, I, I do want to uh, kind of give some conclusion to where okay. we're at in this process because we haven't really <laughs> come up with talking to the person yet that yeah. we need to set the boundaries. Uh -huh. So we're at the stage now where mm -hmm. we've had somebody right. talk into okay. it and you trust them. Right. What do you do then? So then we set the boundary, we give it in writing, and then um, we... Uh, <laughs> the reason why I want you to give it in writing is because you, you, you're not going to get through the conversation. They'll never let you finish. Right. Okay. So okay. you give the, you give the you give the boundary, and then they're going to have a reaction. Your job is not get drawn into it. You just stay on the outside of that reaction, which okay. is really hard. That's hard. Yeah, I was going to say it's not the easiest. Which is thing. usually why I and it's if it's a really intense emotional situation, what I have people do is send the letter, and so they're ah, not present. Right. And allows that person to react, and then we get together after the fact so that I don't have to get drawn into that intensity because if you've been in a relationship where somebody's intense and you've been cowing to it, you're not going to be able to stop it. So, okay, so, so you're listen. saying here's the problems. Right. We need to talk. Yeah, and okay. so here's the deal. So they're going to react mm -hmm. and they're going to keep pushing at you. They're going to want you to go back to the old way. They don't, they're not going to like this new way. And ah. your job is if you fail, what's your job? Because you're going to fail sometimes and you're going you're to not hold the boundary and you're going to give in and that's going to happen. Okay, mm -hmm. so 
the scripture says the difference between a righteous man and a wicked man is though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets up. Right, right. So what your job is, is get up, dust yourself off, and go back at it. And go back at it. And go back at it. And what will happen is mm. the relationship will either, even, either start to turn into a more healthy, less hurtful relationship, or it will start to turn and die. Hmm. Either way, you get what you need. It kind of reminds me a little bit when you mentioned uh, mm -hmm. returning to the issue, mm -hmm. uh, the pray was without, without uh, ceasing yeah. uh, idea mm -hmm. that don't give up on this exactly. just because it didn't work the right. first time. So I, I say boundaries, here's what I say. <laughs> I want to either speed up the healing of the relationship or speed up the destruction of it. Come to some sort of conclusion. Because living saying. in yeah. limbo mm. is way worse than either one of those. Because you get beat oh. from both sides. Yeah, a lot of people live in limbo, do Absolutely. you think? Absolutely. At this point, and Absolutely. it's hopeful. They're optimistic, but not un, but not realistic. They're, perhaps they're um, in denial, mm. and they're they're doing they're exchanging ho real hope for wishful thinking. Mm. Wow. Okay. <laughs> the first book you said to get is uh, safe, people. safe people, and the authors are Cloud and Towns. Correct. Is that right? Right. Okay. This is uh, this is this will help you understand the behavior of someone who's unsafe, and when you understand that behavior, then it helps you know who you need to boundary. Whoever's unsafe in your life, you bound her. I have a new rule in my life. No crazy allowed. No, that's good. No so crazy if people if allowed. You're, if okay. you're crazy, you're not in. I'm sorry. All I right. love you, but you got to stay over there. Great. Okay, Patrick Doyle with us uh, once again here on The Dove. Uh, thanks for being with us. You man. bet. Appreciate Glad it. Boundaries. It. Yes. I have a feeling somebody needs that right now, yeah. so that's a good thing. Thanks yeah. for being with us. Have you a bet. great summer and Come look forward to it. having you back. I will.